Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another in our series of um, enterprise webinars. This morning, we're going to be talking about an inspector calls. That's very exciting, doesn't it? What employers need to know in advance of compliance checks. My name's Esther Carder. I'm a partner at Moore Kings and Smith and very pleased to be chairing this morning. Um, over the coming weeks, um, we'll be covering lots more topics, um, details of which will be available on our website. So please do have a look. I think we've got one coming up on ESG in the middle of May, which is going to be another interesting one. So have a look at that. And if there are any particular topics that you would like to hear about, please do feel free to make suggestions to your regular partner that you deal with. So for those of you who don't know, um, Walking Smith is a top 15 audit tax and advisory firm. We work with lots of entrepreneurial businesses of all different sizes across all different sectors, as well as not for profit and private client. We're also part of More Global, which is an international network um, with presence in over 100 countries. So very well placed to help you with your international growth aspirations. So like I say, this morning, we're going to be talking about um, what you need to know in advance of compliance check. So that the regulatory framework um, that employers operate in is becoming really more sort of complicated than ever um, with sort of things to think about tax and pensions, employment law, global mobility issues, lots of things to keep on top of. And these areas are changing very quickly. Lots of new guidance coming out um, almost on a weekly basis with the laws being updated. So a lot for organisations to deal with and a lot for the leaders of those organisations to think about. And each compliance regime comes with its own system of penalties and sanctions. So getting anything wrong really could have a material financial cost to your business. So today we're going to be covering just some of the areas that you need to look out for, some of the things that are quite topical at the moment. So I'd like to welcome our panellists. We have Tim Stobold, who is our head of tax. Um, he works with businesses right throughout their whole life cycle and has a specialism in employment um, tax matters. I'd like to welcome also Joe Reagan, um, who is Director of People Advisory at Morkings and Smith. And he's previously been Chief People Officer at LK Bennett and other HR roles for flagship brands, including Selfridges, Bupa, L'Oreal and Sainsbury's. So with his experience, Joe brings a real advantage um, to clients having stood in their shoes and been on, the, um, been on that side. So a couple of housekeeping points. Please do ask questions. It's much more interesting if you're asking questions about things that are particular to you. And I will weave those questions into the questions that I'm going to ask the panellists. This is being recorded. So for anybody who couldn't make it, please do share it with them. And please, please, please do fill out the feedback form, which we will share with you after the webinar finishes. So I think we're going to kick off with Tim. Tim, I think it'd be really helpful. I mean, some people will have been through compliance checks already. They will know how to deal with them. And there'll be other businesses where they have not as yet, but it is coming, isn't it? So it'd be really helpful, I think, if you could just give us a flavour and an overview of how compliance checks work and what to generally to expect. Well, uh, th th yeah, thank you, Esther. So, so they, they come in waves. And, and the last time we had a really big batch of compliance checks, I would say was probably four or five years ago. And, and the revenue absolutely goes to town. They go out and visit lots and lots of employers. And, and then I think it quietens down for a while until they feel that things are, are ready to go and be looked at again. I think in the political cycle, we often find in the run up to an election, and it's not very far, I it'll only be next year. Um, there's generally a reluctance to put taxes up, but we always still need to collect tax revenues. And employer compliance checks have always been big money spinners for the revenue. So, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see it now. I'm seeing more now than I have done for the last two or three years. I think it's only going to ramp up that um, uh, you know, businesses, employers will get that opening letter. The opening letter is often quite benign. You know, it's saying we're coming in just to sort of check what's going on in employer compliance review. They'll ask for some um you know basic policies whatever policies you've got around expense reimbursement if there's certain things that have piqued their interest for example you might have had a line in your accounts about redundancies they might ask you know specific stuff that's key to your business you send all that off to the revenue in in the old days they'd turn up you know in force and they'd sit in your office for a day or two but um we're seeing more and more a lot of this is happening by correspondence and the old day the opening day of going through a big questionnaire where they run through every aspect of the employment tax system to try and flush out problems generally is over a call now. And then either that's absolutely fine, you get a clean bill of health and they disappear, which is in the, the minority of cases, sadly, or there's a deeper dive into any issue they, they've identified. So 
if you, you know, as a business post COVID, if you've done any lavish entertaining, if you've taken all the employees on a on an overseas trip, you know they like to delve into that sort of thing. If any problems are identified, the revenue would generally look back four or six years, depending on the scale of um, the, the seriousness of of, of the, the, the failing. And then it's a negotiation around interest and penalties. And I try and talk to the client about this being a positive thing, because if there are things that have been going wrong, you know, it's good to get them right. Um, it's such a broad system around um, the, the, the tax rules in particular. And, and the tax man will also be looking at things like pension compliance, national minimum wage compliance. You may then get separate visits from the pension regulator, from the Home Office, if you've got, um, you know, immigration issues. So, the, the, the tax man, you know, there's a, a level of focus on that today. But we are looking at other areas, and the, the inspector may call from lots of different places. Super, that's really helpful, Tim. So that gives us an overview. So we're going to sort of launch into some detail of some sort of specific areas that might um, be likely to catch people out. So starting with flexible working, obviously we've talked about flexible working a lot um, in all the webinars we have, but we've never really come at it from this point of view. Um, I mean, obviously it's here to stay. Um, lots of employees almost sort of, you know, mandating that employees must spend part of their time working from home. Um, so what pitfalls are there if employees are choosing to sort of reimburse travel costs for employees when mm. they do travel to the office, whether that's for a regular workday or for the odd meeting or whatever? It's um well to, the, the, this is a big problem and a number of the, the the lobby groups are trying to get the revenue to address this because our the, the travel rules the tax rules relating to travel are stuck in the 1950s you know they assume that you're going to turn up punch your card in at the factory work in the factory all day and go home again um but this whole idea of of agile working you know sometimes working at home sometimes working in the office traveling from one place to another the rules don't really cater for those and, and the revenues guidance on this, you know, just isn't really fit for purpose. So they, 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 they've they've made noises about looking at it, but haven't really made any headway into it. What we're seeing amongst the businesses we're speaking to is, look, some things are really easy to deal with. If you have got somebody that turns up to an office every day, their travel from home to their office is ordinary commuting. If you choose to reimburse that, it's taxable. Um, you know, sometimes that comes up in employer compliance review where, senior people in the organization who might live a bit further away are enticed into the office by having you know train fares possibly even air fares paid for them you know that's still ordinary commuting and taxable things get a bit more tricky where you've got the agile working so the, the most common case is what um the, the, the close to the policy that we have at more kings and smith is is the agile working where you can spend some time in the office some time at home you're doing the same work, whether you're at home or in the office, it's just really the location that changes and often your, your choice of whether you're in the home or office is out of convenience rather than any, any particular work need. There, the travel to the office, even if it's only one day a week, the revenues hard and fast for review is, is that is still ordinary commuting and can't be reimbursed. You then get into the slightly more weird and wonderful cases where you could, for example, have an agreement with an employee that they definitely work at home on Monday and Tuesday, they come to the office Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's their ordinary commuting can't be reimbursed, but the revenue guidance goes on for pages and pages and pages around if they're unexpectedly called to the office on Monday or Tuesday to do a task of limited duration. So they're coming in for an appraisal or they're coming in for a you know one-off training course. That then becomes tax um, allowable travel. That could be reimbursed because Monday and Tuesday were home working days. They're called in for an unexpected purpose, not to do their normal job, but for an unexpected purpose. So you can start to find bits of travel that can be reimbursed tax free. Where we've um, uh, found difficulties with clients, is that I can write up a policy for you to say when you can reimburse travel tax free, but the um, the circumstances, everything needs to be considered on the facts. And that policy is very, very unwieldy to actually operate. So for now, what we see from the revenue is it's a very big danger area because where you've taken employees on, especially during COVID and put them on home working contracts, the, 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 the view is now shifting that people want their, their, their teams back in the office and in order to entice them back in, travel costs are being paid. I would say 80%, 90% plus cases, that's gonna be taxable. And, and it's almost the first question the revenue ask when they walk through the front door because they know it's a problem. So I think I'm hearing the messages don't try and be clever. Well, Always it, it, suggesting it, it, they're working from home most of the time and then any trips into the office are, are yeah. reimbursed. It's just not going I, 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 I think it, 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 it can be made to work if you're prepared to police a quite a complicated policy. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I think that's it. I, I, I always sound the word of caution. It can be made to work, but the administration of it often outweighs the benefit. Yeah, sure. 
And there were some concessions during COVID, weren't there, allowing employers to reimburse employees um, who bought home office equipment, computers or desks or whatever. So what can be done now if an employer well, wants to I help mean, their employees? I, I think employers and employees got used to the fact that employers could just kit out an employee for working mm -hmm. at home. Um, and, and that exemption was a limited time exemption that finished in April 2022. So employers can now still buy kit that the employee can have at home but it remains the property of the employer um and, and the you know they can't it has to be bought for a work purpose they can't you know buy an office a desk and an xbox you know it's got to be something that um you know is for the purposes of work that is still a fairly generous exemption that provided you've got this um justification that it's for work and if it's a, a desk and a chair and a computer that's not a difficult argument to run the difficulties arise for employees who leave because if an employee leaves the cost of shipping a desk and a chair back to the office that you probably wouldn't even want in the office often mm -hmm. outweighs it so you say to the employer look, it's fine just keep it you know that again the revenue are are scrutinizing because that is property of the employer that's now been given to the employee and there's there's tax on that too so it's it's a slightly fiddly area i think just be you know a little bit of caution if when employees leave you're allowing them to um keep items that have been provided to them just just be careful around that area and remind us what um people who are working from home quite a lot what can they claim mm -hmm. in terms of i don't know extra fuel bills for example which are yeah. not insubstantial at the moment um the, the the revenue if you're working from home the revenue will allow either the six pound a week everyone got very excited about the six pound a week and martin lewis started talking about it that that doesn't require any records to be kept at all you just need to have a, a form of home working arrangement that's normally in most policies and procedures that employers have anyway or you can claim on actuals and, and actuals is the incremental cost of working at home so the additional cost of keeping the lights on for seven hours a day rather than turning them off when you go to work so that again it, it's perfectly possible to claim that incremental amount if you look at incremental amounts for example council tax there's no incremental amount payable because you work from home so you're looking at the things that are costs that are incurred by virtue of being present in the house so you know water rates no but if you're on a water meter yes electricity yes um so it, it this is why people go for the six pound a week if you do it on actuals you'll get to a higher number but it's, it's quite a you know a job to go through and identify yeah. it all and so, somebody's asked does any of this interfere with you know your your sort of residence being your private residence as opposed to a business residence does, does it over complicate any of that um, no, I mean, the, 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 again, as everybody, including me, as I had my piece in the paper, my moment of fame, <laughs> a, 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 an office at the end of the garden, you know, there was some fear that um, if you used an area of your house or, 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 or built an office, um, mm -hmm. would that would that reduce the capital gains tax exemption when you sell the property? The revenue are pretty clear and actually reasonably generous on that, as long as the space is not used exclusively for work, but you use it for some other purpose too um then then it doesn't affect the capital gains tax relief and you know the, the, the joke when we did our piece in the times in my home office i had to ship everything else out of the office and put it in the garden and the photographer took the picture just to show that it could have been used exclusively to work but behind the photographer was an exercise bike <laughs> <laughs> so, um but, you know, don't believe everything you read in the papers okay that's great and another question has come in what is the guidance around employees with a base in one office traveling to another office on occasion for example an internal meeting is that travel yeah. um if, if reimbursed taxable that, that that's fine so so uh, workplace to workplace travel can always be and always has been capable of being reimbursed tax-free you you then say well at home's my workplace and therefore that's workplace to workplace travel when i travel from home to the office the revenue will only accept that if there's an objective requirement to um, to work from home and, and the revenue guidance has some rather ridiculous examples. If you train guide dogs for the blind, you need to train them in a home environment and therefore home, there's an objective requirement to work from home. You know, it, it, you can't just say I need to work from home because it's a bit more convenient or I've got to drop the kids off. So workplace to workplace travel is fine. Arguing that home is a workplace for this purpose is a lot more difficult. Mm. Somebody said that the HMRC has told them they're not able to claim the £6 a week if they have an office that they can go to for work and only if they live so far away that they're unable to travel to the office. 
that's, that's to you on that same. That, that falls in the, um, the, the the technical term of garbage, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you, you, you need to have home working arrangements. There must be an agreement with your employer that you do work from home. It can't be just a matter of your choice that you're having a dishwasher delivered, you know, and therefore you choose to work from home that day. But if you've got an agreement with your employer that you, you're, you're working agile, you work sometimes from home, sometimes from the office, a six pound is available. Yeah. yeah do, do, Gone. So, sorry. Yeah, if, 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 if any attendees have had guidance contrary to that, you know, send it on to me. I'd love to challenge the revenue on that on that point. Mm, mm. And somebody has a similar question. Can employees still claim the six pound a week if they're choosing to work from home? Which I think you've sort of said it, there's got to be a it, some formal arrangement. Yeah, the, 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 uh, it, I can um, perhaps when Joe's talking, I'll put it in the chat, the guidance on this. that there has to be home working arrangements. But that is just an agreement with the employer that they do work from home rather than the employee ringing in saying I'm not coming in today because I've got a delivery. Yeah, okay. Just to remind, I think somebody's tried to raise their hand to ask a question. Just a reminder that just, just type your questions into the um QA function because we can't we can't switch to the audience to get them to ask the questions live as much as that would be fun. <laughs> so um moving away from working from home and on to mobile working, really. So lots of our clients have had requests from employees to um, work from another country. Mm. Um and with so much of our working days spent on Teams and Zoom, should employers be agreeing to these requests and what are the challenges that they might bring? Um, it, 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 yeah, it's a huge area at the moment. I would say we're probably getting two or three queries a week on, on this where em employees have asked employers a question. And as far as employers are concerned, if their employees are working remotely, it doesn't really matter whether they're in Tunbridge Wells or Antigua, you know, as long as they can match the time zone, they can still um, work remotely and, and effectively. Um, the so employers come to us and say look you know is this something we should be doing what's the risk to the business well um the risk can be quite high and also the benefits to the employees may not always be what they they, they think they are so if an employee is going to work abroad for less than six months um generally they're going to remain in the uk tax system they'll stay on the uk payroll and if they're going to a place that we have a tax treaty with which is most places i'm not sure actually what antigua is one of them but most places um there'll be a tax treaty where they can work in that country for up to six months would probably need to fill out a few forms but generally wouldn't become taxable in that other country so that, 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 that they might be living and working abroad but they're still taxed much like a uk worker if they go for more than six months then things start to get a bit more complicated because they're very likely to fall into the local tax system of the country they're working into and they, they're also quite likely to remain UK tax resident because quite often going for more than six months, but not much more would, would leave you as UK tax resident. So we end up with double taxation. You've got tax deductions on, through the UK payroll still, and you may need then to think about your employer duties in that other country. And this is where, you know, if you're sending 100 people to go and work in another country, that's fine. The cost of the advice will, will, be, will be proportionate to, um, you know, that size um, endeavor. But if you're sending one person do you really, you know, to, let's say, a country where the advice is perhaps not easy to come by, you know, somewhere um, you know, uh, where, where it's not a well-trodden business corridor, the cost of doing the advice and the, the inconvenience and, and admin could become quite difficult in setting up local payrolls and, and that sort of thing. So if they're going more than six months um, and they remain UK resident, then double taxation and we have to think about in-country responsibilities as well as to remain compliant in the UK. If they're going more than six months and ceasing to be UK resident, that's when there's a bit of a benefit to the employee because they might be going to a country with a lower a lower tax rate, so they might have a bit of a tax benefit as well. And then if they're going long, long term and, and then are coming back only to work in the UK from time to time, they would probably only then be taxable on their UK work days coming back. So you've got four different permutations of going abroad, a mixture of remaining UK resident, ceasing UK resident and falling in the overseas tax regime or not. Um, generally, employers uh, that we speak to have a fairly liberal policy for somebody who wants to go and do a month somewhere else, because a month they're on the UK payroll still, um, they're unlikely to create any, any host country obligations, and that's fine. But a lot of employers are starting to think very carefully about people going longer, certainly more than six months, you know, extreme caution should be exercised because you're very likely to create some host country obligations. Social security. So in the UK, what we know is national insurance. It may feel high at 13.8%, but it's an absolute dream compared to European rates of social security, which are often double. So if you've got somebody falling into a another country's social security regime and they trigger a, an employer liability, 
you might find that they're really going to cost you more money. So this, this sort of generous thing you're doing of allowing employees to work abroad could be quite an expensive thing for the organisation. You've also got corporate tax issues. Are they creating a taxable permanent establishment? Well, that's a whole pain to deal with. And then a whole load of other issues. So if they're working in a hotel, it's a hotel Wi-Fi secure. If you've got GDPR and data privacy issues, are there local health and safety rules that you're not aware of? And you as an employer have an obligation to make sure they've got a safe working space. Um, you know, loads and loads of things. So I, I, I think that 30 day rule is exercised by lots of employers, more Kings and Smith included, and a, a, you know, a very um, careful pause of thought for employees who are working abroad for longer. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. We've got some detailed questions coming in on the sort of the working from home and reimbursement. I think maybe we'll come back to those at the end if we've got time. If not, Tim will um, yeah, answer them we, we, individually. <laughs> we, we, we pick up as many questions as we can in the follow up. So do do file them all in and don't be disappointed if we don't answer them all live. So quite a lot of um, certainly quite a lot of my clients and a lot of clients on this call will be using freelancers and subcontractors and the off payroll oh, off payroll working rules previously obviously known as IR35 have been enforced for a couple of years now. What activity have you seen from the HMRC in terms of actually policing compliance with these rules and just remind us also what size company do these rules apply to? Yeah. So um the, the reform of IR35 that happened in the, the public sector in 2017, and then it was introduced into the private sector after a few delays in 2021, that, um, you know, lots and lots of work was done at the time to understand what that meant for businesses that had a, a you know, a freelance labour population that they were using. Uh, and and you know, much lobbying was 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 done to um, uh, try and get the regime modified, delayed, abolished, and, and all of it other than a brief bit of respite we got when it was abolished for about a week in October last year. Um, but that 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 was reversed. It, it, it's come in, you know, as originally drafted. It doesn't apply to small companies. So if you've got a business annual turnover less than 10.2 million, balance sheet value less than 5.1 million, or, or, or fewer than 50 employees, if you can meet two out of three of those tests um, uh, and, and, and don't break them for two consecutive years, you're likely to fall in the small company exemption, which means that you, you, know, you carry on as you were, that when a freelancer invoices you, you pay that invoice and don't have to worry about anything else. If you're a large company or part of a larger group, um, then you need to make sure that you're assessing the status of anybody that you're paying who, who's, who's providing their services through an intermediary. And what we're really talking about there is self-employed contractors who provide their services through a company. We've seen close to no compliance activity in this area, and, 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 and but you shouldn't take comfort from that because one of the um, announcements when the rules came in to such a, 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 a you know volume of, of, of disapproval and, and unhappiness was the revenue said, we won't really police them for the first year. So from April 21 to 22, we had a soft landing. They said there'll be no financial penalties charged for non-compliance. The revenue will be there to assist businesses to understand how to apply the rules. Um, but so up until April 22, the revenue haven't really looked at any compliance in this area at all. They've just been available to answer queries and good luck if you tried to call them and ask them anything. Um, we Now April 22 um, has, has long since passed and we're running up to what will pass April 23 now. There's a full year of operation of these rules where the revenue will want to come and test whether they're being applied correctly. The most difficult thing is assessing status. And, and we know the revenue have got their marvelous tool, the um, uh, employment status indicator, and you can plug all the facts and figures in and it will tell you whether it's self-employed, employed or something in between. That is a massively unpopular feature of the system because people don't actually think it gets to the right answer. A number of cases have gone to the tribunal where the indicator would indicate that it was a uh, you know an employed status, but particularly TV presenters and, 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 and personalities have ended up being able to argue self-employed status. Adrian Charles was a, was a, a recent example. Um, so they, they are, they, all these arguments have been under the old IR35 regime, but the, the, the rules are the same under the new one about assessing status. So most employers I talk to are using the employment status indicator to some extent to assess status of their workers. Uh, and, and then once the status has been assessed, they're required to issue a status determination state, uh, statement. They should have a, a you know a, an appeals process to allow uh, workers to appeal the decision you've made. And there's a whole load of record keeping to be kept. Now, I, I think 
most practitioners, me included, are of the view that everybody got quite excited about this in April 2021. The revenue have been very low profile on it since then. And, and even if compliances and procedures and policies were put in place at the beginning, people have just drifted back to old ways. And, and as self-employed contractors or limited company contractors are engaged, depending who the budget holders are, whether they go through the right process to be identified as uh, you know, as, as possibly falling in within the system, I think has fallen down and the revenue will absolutely go to town on that. Yeah, the key, the key I think, is, as you say, is having a really strict internal process for deciding who is going to make that yeah. decision and, and then making that you making sure that you have then documented that decision and maybe keep a record of the CES checker yeah. questionnaire yeah. that you filled out. Yeah, absolutely right. You can print out the the end of the test checker, and if the if the employment status indicator test is getting to the answer that everybody thinks is the right answer, yeah, stick it on the file, and the revenue yeah. will have to abide by it. Um, but if you if you keep having run ups at that test until it gets the answer, and you keep tweaking the answers, you know, mm-hmm. you've got to be prepared then to defend the way in which you you've completed it. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And what about, um, I mean, other things like termination and redundancy costs? HMRC have always taken a close interest in those, haven't they? Is this still the case? And what are the risk areas? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it's a number that jumps out of the accounts if you have a, um, um, you know, a big round of redundancies, it's separately disclosed. So that's one of the risk factors the revenue will look at when they um, come in to do employee compliance reviews. The, the, the change, I would still think of them as recent changes, they were way back in 2018, where the, the way in which um, payments in lieu of notices uh, were, were taxed changed significantly. In the old days, it used to be a contractual payment in lieu of notice was taxable. A non-contractual payment in lieu of notice you know, was capable of being non-taxable. Um, but in 2018, the revenue designed this sort of, um, it's like a GCSE question as I'm doing maths with my kids at the moment, this <laughs> formally you had to apply in, in order to calculate the taxable payment in lieu of notice, which, you know, pretty much would 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 tax mm. every payment in lieu of notice. I mean, that's, that's the consequence of these rules. So, so there's, there's still a, a misunderstanding about when you're making what you consider to be, you know, ex gratia gratuitous payments to your employees. This formula can deem those payments to be a payment in lieu of notice if one wasn't otherwise due. Um, the other point I mentioned earlier about transfer of assets, um, you know, with all this homeworking, there's quite a lot of employ- employer-owned assets in the employee's premises. Quite often the employee is allowed to keep them, so the revenue look at that too. But I, it, it, generally we find in most opening letters for employer compliance reviews, the revenue will say, you know, send us your last five um, you know, terminations or, or, or redundancies. Let's see the settlement agreement. Let's see the contract of employment, and let's see the surrounding correspondence, and, and where you've actually had to pay out some bigger amounts. You know, we're paying tens of thousands out. Getting these things wrong can be very, very expensive. Um, so it, it, it's one where if if your paperwork around redundancies hasn't changed for a few years, it maybe it's under the old payment in lieu of notice rules, and it just needs to look at before the revenue um, catch up with it. Okay. And I mean, you know, attraction and retention of employees is, is a big thing at the minute and offering a sort of flexible working package can be, you know, a way to sort of get ahead of your competitors. So quite a lot of our clients operate salary sacrifice schemes and mm-hmm. things like pensions or electric cars, um, which seems like a really good idea. But are there sort of pitfalls here that we need to look out for? Um, yeah, I mean, it's something the revenue always look at and there's great big um reams of guidance on their their their, their website about unsuccessful salary sacrifices where the paperwork isn't quite right or the order in which things have happened isn't quite right pension salary sacrifices you know we i can't push those enough you know they're an absolute no-brainer it it gives the employees a tax relief sooner there's an employer's ni saving and you can decide how you deal with that you could give it all to the employee as additional pension contributions or you you could use that to try and sort of fine-tune your profit margin um, so, but, and, and most pension companies will produce the paperwork you need. So, you know, that paperwork's often in quite good order. As long as the salary sacrifice is, is, is put in place before the employee's got the contractual right to earnings, you don't try and retrospectively sacrifice salary. You know, that's generally okay. Um, cycle to work, again, most schemes provide the documentation. And then electric cars, most lease providers have caught onto the idea that they sell an awful lot of electric cars onto company leasing schemes because the benefit in kind rate is so low, it's going to stay at 2% until the end of, or end of, until 5th of April, 2025. 
and then it creeps up 1% a year until um, April 2027, where it's 5%. But frankly, a 5% benefit in kind rate is still pretty um, attractive. Mm. Uh, the, the shine's gone off electric car schemes a little bit, but nothing to do with the tax system. It's just a, such a long wait to actually get the vehicles delivered. So they're not quite as exciting as getting your new car next week. You might be waiting nine months before it arrives. But it's it, because it's a new area of tax and it's become very popular very quickly. Our sense is the revenue are going to come and, well, pardon the pun, kick the tyres of these schemes um, and, and, and just make sure they've been properly implemented. The leasing company will provide you the paperwork. My, my, my takeaway point here is don't take tax advice from a car salesman. You know, get, get the paperwork looked at by your tax advisor. Make sure it does actually tick all the boxes and you don't have a fleet of 50 cars and finally the revenue come in and tell you that you didn't get your paperwork right and you've exposed yourself to a lot of risk there. Super. I'm going to squeeze in one more audience question for you, Tim, before we move over to Joe, because um, I think it might be relevant for people. So if a freelancer completes an IR35 determination themselves, does this mean a freelancer is considered mm -hmm. outside IR35 and can therefore just invoice it and we're fine? I think it's well, important to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, I think it's interesting and useful for the contractor, the freelancer, to fill out the status determination because they might be very much aware of the facts of their engagement. You know that some of the questions that they do, they provide equipment to do their job, where they may need, they may know that far better than the employer or the business knows. But the risk is that the businesses, you've got no defence in saying the contractor did it, and you know without wishing to um, cast the contractors in a bad light, they have got a, a bit of a motivation to get the one answer and not the other. And um, so, so you, you need to go through the way those questions have been answered and, and, and interrogate them, really. Um, the questions, the main areas that have an influence on the answer is around um, control of the individual you know, and whether they can provide a substitute to do their work. If they've got to the right answer by saying, well, they're completely uncontrolled and they could provide a substitute every day of the week to do their work, but you as a business know that's absolute rubbish that they, um, you know, that, that it's only them that you would ever engage if they provided the substitute, you'd cancel the contract and you do manage and supervise their work quite closely. If the answers in the status determination say something different, you are at risk. You know, the revenue will say to you, well, this, this is just rubbish. You know, you've just ticked the boxes to get to the right answer. Here's an assessment for all the PAY you should have deducted. Agreed. And I think that whole right of substitution point becomes more difficult the more senior they are as yeah. well. Yeah, I, I, the, the, the substitution point comes from a case about concrete mixing. You know, I, I don't mind on my building site whether it's, you know, Bob or Dave that turns up to mix concrete. But if you've employed a, you know, creative consultant to come and deliver a project yeah. for you, you don't want them sending somebody else. So mm -hmm. really, at that point, you're looking at the control tests. And it's quite difficult to argue that they're a complete loose cannon yeah. controlling their own work with no supervision. So mm -hmm. th this is why the status indicator, the CES tool, is quite difficult to get to the uh, the self-employed answer not impossible but quite difficult agreed and i think the, the take home from that is don't fudge it because it'll <laughs> come back to bite you so joe moving on to you we haven't forgotten about you although i'm conscious we've got 11 minutes left but what are the common misconceptions around national minimum wage and national living wage and how can we get caught out if we're not complying with those yeah i guess um in short, the answer is that the national uh, minimum wage is for employees or people that are under 23 and the national living wage is for those over 23. Um, and principally that is the only difference is with regards to age in terms of how they do that. And I guess um, some of the penalties um, that are liable if you get that wrong or you're not paying somebody the national minimum wage or the national living wage um, is that they can um, file a claim to ACAS um, for incorrect pay and they can go back um, six years um, for pay and you'll have to correct their pay to bring that up. Um, you could also face a fine of up to £20,000 and a minimum of £100 per employee um, or worker that was affected. Um, you can have legal action, including criminal proceedings for not um, paying those um, rates. And there's also things like name and shame. So the government are very good at naming and shaming and the reputational damage also that you can do to your business um, is a consequence to that as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly a lot of my clients, things like interns, you know, they're trying to make sure that they're paying them sort of, you know, at least the amount, at least the, the minimum amount they should, because no one wants to be named and shamed for 
um, abusing people's good nature of wanting to do free work for them. Um, businesses are trying to grow their workforces um, as they rebuild themselves after COVID and start to grow. But obviously, um, you know, there are certain checks that need to be done when taking new employees on. What, what should employers be looking out for when they're taking on employees or new contractors? So I guess um, some of the advice that we give our clients um, from People Advisory is very much around employment status and making sure that you identify, is this person an employee? Are they a worker or are they self-employed? So um, as the whole bit that we've already had around IR35 and doing those tests, but I think it's about clearly defining their employment status, making sure that your contract is up to date and uh, legally compliant, particularly for workers um, and employees, because there is a difference in terms of holiday pay calculations. So we had the case of um, Harper Brazil, where um, somebody who was a term time contract was put on a permanent employee contract, which entitled them to 5.6 weeks annual holiday. And because of the way that their uh, contract was written, they actually um, took them to court and actually got back pay for holiday that they were entitled to. And it caused a number of different changes to that. So I think it's making sure that the employment status is correct and that um, you've got people on the right contract. And if you are unsure of somebody's employment status, um, we're available to obviously confirm that and support them. Um, and what sort of penalties are there for getting this sort of thing wrong? So again, if you're not completing right to work checks, um, there's a civil penalty of up to £20,000 per employee. You've also got a um, criminal penalty for um, employers or directors for companies in terms of imprisonment. So there is the five year custodial um, sentence that's available and also unlimited fines as well for um, employers. So yeah, quite big financial penalties potentially. Yeah. And are you seeing organisations experiencing difficulties when they've used sort of poorly drafted contracts or handbooks or policy documents? Yeah, we do. So I guess one of the pitfalls of having a poorly worded contract or a handbook or policies is the fact that there is a lack of um, certainty, which leaves room for dispute and litigation. And I guess one of the things um, that we absolutely ask our clients to do is around making sure that they protect themselves so making sure that when you're drafting your contracts that you've got really um, strong robust post-termination restrictions in terms of protecting um, your business and your assets um, I guess some of it is around actually if you've got the right contract and you've got the right employee handbook in place, it protects you as well in terms of being able to defend claims when it comes to a point of um, challenge. Thank you, Joe. We've got a couple of questions coming. I think some are hangovers from Tim's um, session. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm typing that out. You're I'm, typing, I'm sorry, are you? Uh, as they go, but yeah, yeah but by all means, pull, pull out the interesting ones yes, if you want to answer so any lines. Somebody's, somebody's asked about PLMD implications on claiming business mileage on those with a salary sacrifice electric vehicle car. I mean, PLFDs are just, just a minefield in themselves, aren't they? Yeah, so um, most people are familiar with claiming amounts for mileage where they're using their own car. So the, 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 the fixed profit mileage scheme is at 45p a mile for 10,000 miles. People are used to claiming that. If they've got a salary sacrifice electric car, then um, what they've got is a company car, so that they, 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 they can't claim the mileage at the same 45p rate because they're not suffering the depreciation on their own car. So if they've got the um, uh, a, 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 an electric car, the benefit in kind rate is 2%, as I say, going up to 5% over the next few years. That's applied to the list price of the car for the provision of the car. From memory, and I need to check this, maybe we'll do this in the follow-up, there's a, uh, a fixed amount to cover the, elect the electricity that's used to, um, to, 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 to drive the miles, and you apply the same low percentage to that rate. So it all boils down, I think, I will confirm in the follow-up, that the, the benefit in kind for the company paying for private mileage is still very, very low. Um, I mean, the, the, again, electric cars, the shine has gone off them slightly because the cost of putting electricity in them is has gone up with energy mm -hmm. prices, but we hope that will become normal again. I'll, I'll do a, a, in the follow-up, I'll do an extra couple of sentences around the, um, the cost of um, the electricity. Yeah. 
So question here around legal working. So can I check with the right to work check? Is the penalty that you have an illegal worker, for example, someone with a UK passport joins but doesn't complete a right to work check and during an order it's proven that they do have the right to work via their UK passport but the check wasn't done, would this result in penalties? Also, we conduct our checks on the first day, but I believe the guidance says it can be done shortly before the first day. Um, so can it be done on a Friday if they're going to start on a Monday, for example? Yeah, so good practice um, is obviously to check people's right to work before you make an offer of employment. Mm -hmm. um, but you can check it on their first day. And it's quite common in terms of organisations. I guess um, prevention is better than getting a fine. Um, there are occasions where HM, uh, Border Force will come in and do random checks. I think if you can evidence that you've got robust systems in place and it's a one-off, they're more likely to perhaps let you go. Um, I think if there are occasions where we have got some clients that have come to us and they said they don't complete any right to work checks um, and therefore they will impose fines um, for those. I think mm -hmm. it's just about good housekeeping, it's about um, good practices and having uh, records in place to evidence that if you do get a random spot check that you can say that it is a one-off and not something that you regularly miss. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Tim, this is probably one for you. Um, around indemnity, around sort of the off-payroll working mm. rules, that is effective with intermediaries or not? Well, it, it, it is, but it's an indemnity. And, and what we say to all clients who've got an indemnity is it's only as good as, as your ability to enforce it. So HMRC will still send the bill to you, the employer. So mm -hmm. HMRC come in, they look at your status determination statement and say they disagree with some of them. You're unable to defend that. So HMRC serve you up the, um, the tax and the national insurance bill. You have to pay that, you know, plus interest, plus penalty of the revenue of being really mean. You may then try and enforce the indemnity against the contractor. Um, and, you know, you, you'll need to make a commercial assessment at that time as to whether you know, that's something that's worthwhile doing, whether you're going to incur more legal fees and, 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 and loss of management time recovering it than you're ever going to get back. Um, if the contractor is still working for you, the easiest way to enforce the indemnity is start skimming it off the payments that you're still making them. But if you say to a contractor, we're only going to pay you 50p in the pound until you've, you've repaid what you owe to us, you might find the contractor wanders off down the road and stops working for you. So the, the indemnity, if I ever ask a question, should you have one? Well, yes, of course, it's better to have an indemnity than not. But HMRC are not at all interested in it because the primary liability sits with the employer. Super, thank you. Right, there are some questions left which um, Tim and Joe will um, give you written answers to. I'm going to, conscious that we've got one minute left, so I'm going to finish with a future-looking question a uh, forward-looking question for Tim. Um, so, Tim, if there's a change of government next year, we've already been told that the recent pension changes will be reversed and the non-domicile um, regime will be abolished. Is there any other changes that employers should start to think about or plan for now? Well, so the, that it works the, out? The, 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 this, this has sort of come about from a chat Joe and I having. I might hand over to Joe on this. That we we got um, you know quite heavily involved in the gender pay gap reporting rules when they came in because. You know, lots of our clients had some really good news to shout about, and that helps on on raising employer profile and brand. Lots of them had some bad news, and they needed to make sure the messaging around that was properly put forward as to how they were going to address it or why the gender pay gap arose. Right now, there's a lot of chat in uh, the HR circles around the ethnicity pay gap reporting, which currently is voluntary. The revenue, well, not revenue, the government have put out a lot of guidance around the calculating it, the um, data privacy and GDPR issues around collecting data on ethnicity, and it's all voluntary. And, and some businesses are choosing to do it at, at the moment. Some businesses are running numbers just so they can see what the news looks like, so they can start to, to plan for addressing any ethnicity pay gap. The Labour Party, if they were to come into government, have said they would make that compulsory. Um, now, it's only we, we think it would follow the same as the gender pay gap reporting. It would only be for employers with greater than 250 employees. But the work we're doing now is to run the ethnicity pay gap um, calculation with employers now. Let's just see what the answer is. If it's a good answer, that's great. You can shout about it. I think that helps employer brand. 
uh, you know, it's our message with where most companies are hoping to, to, to go and present to the outside world. If it's not good news, it's about forming a strategy now, either to address the pay gap or to make sure you're messaging about why the pay gap exists and, you know, what, why it, it, the, the raw numbers are a blunt instrument. They, they, they don't adequately address part-time workers versus full-time workers. So it may be the messaging around it needs to be looked at. All I would say is, as we can see that coming, even under the current government, it may at one day come, become compulsory. Um, so it, it, it's an area that it's in sharp focus at the moment because a change of government would make it compulsory. But I think it's just something worthwhile looking at at the moment. And Joe, you did a lot of work around gender pay gap reporting. Have you got anything else on that? Yeah, I think some of the watch outs is around data and having data available. So a lot of HR systems around um, gathering that data, particularly around ethnicity. Um, a lot of people aren't capturing that data. So I think one of the watch outs is that if this does come in, there is a big piece of work to be done in terms of gathering that data and making sure that your data is correct. So going through your systems, auditing, making sure that the data is as good as it can be in preparation for that. And yeah. again, it's around the narrative. It's, it is about um, the numbers on their own don't tell the picture and the story. Um, and I think that you do need to do that analysis piece around what that data tells you um and gives you a better picture of where your workforce yeah. is at yeah yeah Tim, some... Joe, thank you very much we must we must end we've gone two minutes over i okay. failed in my chair job to finish on time so thank you very much i hope everyone found that super interesting don't forget it has been recorded so please do share it with anyone who missed it or watch it again at your leisure um we will try to answer those questions that still remain and please please do fill out the feedback form it's super useful in helping us to shape future webinars and seminars so thank you very all much for attending and enjoy your day thank you bye-bye thanks Cheers, bye